Good morning to you all. Uh, today is the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. If you happen to be a confirmand, uh, that is the answer to the question about what today's liturgical date is. Uh, the confirmands have a worship notes sheet that they fill out and every week they they get to, to note the, the calendar date and the liturgical date. So uh, hint confirmands, those are both on screen right now. Uh, we do have announcements, of course, as always, and it is just amazing to me that Canaan, Connecticut is gray. Uh, something tells me there's some glitch in how Connecticut does reporting, because there's just no way that their infection rate for COVID could be so much lower than everybody else's every week. But uh, the map looks just the same as it has for the last several weeks but the numbers behind the red are coming down. Uh, two weeks ago, we were at 241.8 infections per 100,000 population, and we're down to about half of that at 121.6. So we're definitely moving the right direction. Um, it's important to realize, though, that those numbers still put us solidly in the red. And as a community, um, we're, we watch different levels of lag. So as the infection rate comes down, there's a lag before the hospitalization rate comes down. There's a lag uh, before the ICUs start clearing out. So just be aware of all of that. Um, you know, be safe, be smart. We're going to continue with online only services for the next couple weeks. Um, again, our rubric is that we need to be out of the red for two weeks before we return to the sanctuary. But uh, keep your eyes peeled. We will be back, and we are going to get through this as we always have. Um, some other announcements. The thrift shop is going to be closed, so if you are feeling thrifty, um, that's a beautiful thing, but you can't go shop. Uh, you can, however, get in touch with Becky McKee, and she will happily open up if you have donations to make. So talk to Becky if you need to get in for that purpose. Um, registration has begun for Silver Lake Summer Camp, and it's one of the best places on the planet for young people. I have spent a lot of time up there as dean for conferences or as counselor. Um, it is a life-changing experience for our young people. So if you have a young person in your life, sign them up for a summer camp session, because this year the Women's Society is paying for it. So there is absolutely no downside to sending kids to camp this year. Um, heartily recommend it, and I have sent an email out to the congregation with registration information for that. Um, moving on, we do still continue to collect food for the St. James Food Pantry. We have the bins on the front porch of the church, so drop those off and we'll make sure that it gets delivered. For Dorothy Day, our next Sunday is go our next Saturday rather is going to be February 26th. So uh, you can talk to Val. She will make sure that you have the information you need about menu and making sure that we have the right people signed up. Uh, Val, thank you for taking care of that. And then finally, just a note that uh, our confirmation class meets every other week, and this is the week that we will be meeting right after church. So students and mentors, we do look forward to seeing you in confirmation class right after the service. Are there any other announcements that we need to hear for the good of the congregation? If so, I'd invite you to unmute. Sherry, I see you waving your hand. Um, Danbury Appalachia Service Project is um, very excited to be trying to get a group together to go again this year. Our informational session is on the 23rd of February. Um, it looks like it might be at our church, but I have to check dates and make sure nothing else is going on there first. Um, we also have a virtual option as well. Um, you need to be 14 years or, and, or older and finishing your freshman year in high school to be eligible to go and adults and, and teens are welcome. All right, very good. And Sherry, let me invite you to send me that as a text, and I'll put that out to the congregation with the weekly word this week. Okay. And uh, just a reminder, um, Bev 
who had broken her wrist is still recuperating. We're hoping that she'll be back with us by the middle of February. But uh, for now, we've got a bunch of volunteers trying to hold things down. Um, we may have things slip through the cracks. Um, so if there's something that any of you need to share, if you need help, if you need anything, um, you can leave a message on the voicemail at church, but it's probably best if you contact me directly and I will then make sure that we get things to the people who need them. Do we have any other announcements before we begin our worship? I don't see anybody raising a hand. In that case, let us begin our worship as we hear the introit. Good morning, please join in the call to worship. Come people of God to the one in whom we trust. Praise God who delivers and rescues us. God is our rock of refuge, our strong fortress. God saves us amidst wickedness and cruelty. Hope in God who has created you. Open yourself to the one who knows you well. God accepts us, even when people do not. God affirms us, even when we fail. Our God gives us tasks to do and strength to do them. God's word of love is ours to proclaim. We have come to embrace the mysteries of our faith. We are here to worship the God who empowers us. Our opening hymn this morning is, This is My Father's World. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and drown me. Of rocks and trees of a 
bright skies and seas, God's hands the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world, how birds their carols raise, the morning light, the flowers bright, declare their maker's praise. Our God has made this world and shines in all that's fair. In rustling grass I hear God pass who speaks to me everywhere. Our God has made this world. Oh, let us never forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. God trusts us with this world to keep it clean and fair. All earth and trees, the skies and seas, God's creatures everywhere. Would you join me in our prayer of invocation? God of love, in whose name we have been consecrated for discipleship and service, encounter us in this hour that we may grow in knowledge and actions. Disturb our certainties, so we will be open to new insights. Upset our priorities, to make room for faith, hope, and love. Expand our horizons, to encompass ideas we have not entertained before. Open our hearts, to people we have failed to welcome into our midst. Perfect among us that childlike trust that allows change to transform us in the presence of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week, we offer a prayer of confession. We do it as a way of connecting ourselves with God, with allowing God to reach into our hearts and transform us as we hand off those bits of ourselves that are most in need of change. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, you know us better than we know ourselves, but we have not believed this. You care about us, even when we do not love ourselves, but it has been hard for us to understand that this is true. We see so dimly and hear your word so faintly that we doubt your truth. We dare not trust the prophets or risk the cost of discipleship. We are afraid to believe, hope, and endure when there is suffering all around us. O oh God, grant us courage to change, to follow Jesus in spite of ridicule and rejection. Yet keep us from insisting on our own way, which may not be your way. Amen. Friends, the good news is that we are a people who know what it is to live in God's love. We experience God's forgiveness day in and day out. We are drawn to right relationships. And so I declare to you that our sins are indeed forgiven, that once more God has forgiven us and set us free. Thanks be to God, who indeed restores us to those relationships that we value so highly, with God, with one another, and with all creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Have you ever felt like you're not old enough or big enough or experienced enough to do important things? In today's reading from the book of Jeremiah, we find the story about how God called Jeremiah to be a prophet. And God begins by telling Jeremiah, before you were even born, I knew you. I put my hand on you and I called you to be a prophet, to speak to the nations. 
Well, Jeremiah was worried. He was afraid that he wouldn't be able to do the job, and he told God, but I'm just a boy. I can't do that. That's, that's a job for grown-ups. That's a job for people with lots of experience to go and talk to kings. But God reminded Jeremiah that all he needed to do was to trust. And God reached out a hand and touched Jeremiah on the mouth and said, because I've placed my hand upon you, you will be able to speak to kings. You will be able to build up and to tear down. You will be able to plant and harvest. You will be able to make a difference in the world. When God calls us to do work in the world, when God calls us to speak up or to take our part, God always gives us the strength that we need. And so my hope for you is, even if you're not big, even if you're not experienced, even if you're not very old, you will find the ways that God has touched you and given you the strength and the courage to do great things. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the ways that you call us to do your work in the world. Help us to be like Jeremiah who even though he was afraid, he trusted you. Help us to trust you that same way so that we can follow you and do your work in the world. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses one through 13. If I speak in the tongue of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, and if I have pro prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It does not, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but, for, but, for pro, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For all we know in, par in part, and we prostate only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we, we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. <coughs> and, and now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Our second reading is Luke chapter 4 verses 21 through 30. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the glorious words that come from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent home to none of them except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the, pros of the prophet Elisha, and none of them 
was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they may hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we ask that you would speak to us, that we might hear your call to love. Amen. So let me start with a word of thanks and a word of explanation. Connor, Zach, you did a great job with the videos. And we're going to have the confirmands recording scriptures and participating in our online worship in a variety of ways. So you two got to kick it off, and I'm really glad that you did. You did a wonderful job. So the sermon begins, and it begins with this reading from 1 Corinthians, the one that we all know so well, the one that talks about faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now, if you have ever been to a wedding, I guarantee you that you have heard that reading. And if you're like most folks who go to wedding after wedding after wedding after wedding over the course of your life, you have heard this reading so many times that you could just recite it from memory, almost. Or maybe not even almost. Maybe it's just burned into you in a way that it comes right out of your mouth as you hear someone else reading it. But you know there's a challenge with this reading, this reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that's that we so often forget that it comes right after 1 Corinthians, you got it, chapter 12. Chapter 12, as we've been reading for the last couple weeks, talks about the gifts of the Spirit and how the Spirit gives different people different gifts. It talks about how we're all members of one body, even though we may be different parts of that body. On the face of it, that sounds like such a happy thing, some beautiful imagery that just keeps coming, one good thing after another, after another, after another. But if we broaden our context a bit, if we think about 1 Corinthians as an entire book, we realize that maybe we're not quite hearing these passages the way the Apostle Paul meant us to hear them. You see, the church in Corinth was having some problems. Paul so often wrote to the churches when they were having trouble. And the problem in Corinth is that everybody thought that their gift was the best gift. Everybody thought that the way that they were experiencing their faith, the way they were doing God's work, was better than the way the person next to them was doing it. And so when Paul wrote chapter 12, he wasn't saying, oh, isn't it sweet how the Spirit gives us all different gifts? He was actually wagging his finger at the church. He was saying, look, folks, God gives different gifts to different people. There's some attitude behind it. In the same way that when he talks about how we're all members of one body, he isn't saying something sweet and nice. He's saying, look, folks, we're all part of one body. You can't say because I'm a hand, I'm not part of the body. He's really leaning in to the problems in the church, offering a hard corrective. And so we turn the page to chapter 13 this passage that we read at weddings, when we think of couples who are pledging their love for each other, and we read it in context. Because Paul is looking at a church where people are not loving one another. This isn't written about couples. This is written about just regular old kind of Christian love, the kind we're all supposed to have for each other. And so Paul reminds them, he says, you know, love, it's patient, it's kind, 
It's not envious or arrogant or boastful or rude because that's how people had been. And then he finally turns the page and instead of telling people what it isn't, he starts talking about love in positive ways, how it's patient, how it's kind, how it doesn't insist on its own way, how it isn't resentful, how it doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. So often, we in the church need to be reminded what it means to love one another. Now at King Street, I've got to say, we are a remarkably healthy church. And I've told you this before any number of times. But when I first walked through the door at King Street, I experienced you as a congregation that knew well what it means to love one another. I remember commenting to someone early on that if I were ever stupid enough to want to get back into parish ministry, it would have to be a church like King Street. Well, apparently, as we come up eight years-ish together now, I was stupid enough to get sucked back in, but blessed enough to get pulled back in by the power of love. When we love one another, when we care for one another, when we pray for one another and give each other a break when we need it, when we forgive each other in those times where we have wronged one another, we're living out the kind of love that the Apostle Paul wrote about. Of course, I would like to believe that we will always see our congregation as just the perfection of God's love. Reality, though, is we're human. We slip. We have our moments. But fortunately, we're not quite like the folks in that synagogue in Nazareth where Jesus was preaching. We were reading this story about Jesus preaching in his hometown synagogue for the last couple weeks as well. The story of how they gave him the scroll of Isaiah and how he read about the recovery of sight to the blind and release to the captives, and how God's year of favor was upon the people, and then how he rolled up the scroll and sat down and began to preach, telling the people, this scripture is fulfilled today in your hearing. And last week, when that ended our reading, it felt like things were going pretty well. But today we pick back up. And we find that the people are starting to realize just what Jesus meant. He wasn't just offering them a word of, of hope and love for them and them only. Instead, he was giving them a word about how God's love is for other people, too. Talking about how even in the times of the prophets, God's grace was poured out upon other people. How there was that widow in Zarephath that God blessed, even when God wasn't giving food to the people in Israel. Telling the story of how Naaman the, prophet, Naaman the general was healed, even though he was a foreigner, when there were people in Israel who were not healed. That's the kind of story that makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? I know that in my work as a chaplain, I often find people who expect God's blessings for them, expect healing for themselves or their loved ones. And when it doesn't come, sometimes they're angry. Sometimes they have trouble getting their heads around the notion that someone else got better, but their loved one didn't. And that's what happens in that synagogue where Jesus is preaching. When the people begin to realize that maybe Jesus isn't their, their special lucky charm, but instead is there to bring God's grace and love to the whole world, not just to the folks in his hometown synagogue. And so they have this moment where they kind of get their backs up, where 
Well, more than that, they drag him off. They, they, they try and push him off a cliff. They're so upset with this message of how God blesses other people. But Jesus slips out and goes on for the whole rest of his ministry, never again returning to his hometown. These are strange stories to have put together. The story of the surly commandment to love one another, the story of Jesus almost chucked off a cliff by the congregation that loved him as a child. But Jesus had his learning moment. He learned that people who have changed your diapers don't want you to tell them that they need to change. But so often the story of love, the commandment to love, is also a commandment to change. We can never love one another perfectly if we always do things the same old way. And we found that the work of love, the work of building love, of spreading love, of expanding the circle of love has been challenging for the church. We recently celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. And we remember him as one of those figures who drew people together, rabbis and pastors marching hand in hand for justice, for inclusion, for love. But we quickly forget that while Dr. King and, and those who were marching with him made their way across the bridge in Selma, they were opposed by church people who didn't want to see love and justice spread beyond the circle with which they were comfortable. We've watched the same thing as we have gone through the decades, as we have included lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender folks into the full fellowship of the church. And we find that there are still church folks today who oppose that love. For us, the task is to keep our eyes open for those places where we live out love that is not arrogant or envious or boastful or rude. Where instead we live out a love that believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We learn that indeed faith and hope are there for us, but that it's the love that endures. May we then as God's very own people expand the circle of love as we build justice and community, not only for those people that we already know, but to bring in strangers and outsiders, to bring in those who have been oppressed to make the community of God broader and bigger. And in that, may we be blessed. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your call to love, for the love that has touched our lives, that has challenged us to grow and to broaden our perspectives and to widen our circle. We thank you for love that touches us not only in speech, but in action. We give you thanks, O God, for this your church gathered virtually today. And we give you thanks for our place in the King Street community and in the city of Danbury. We ask your blessing as we continue to work, to love, to advocate for justice. We ask your blessing, O oh God, for the Pacific House Homeless Shelter, for the men who are facing its possible closure. And we ask that you would be present 
with those who are seeking to find a way forward. We ask your blessing for Bev as she recovers from her broken wrist, that you would grant her a full and speedy recovery. We pray for Jen's family members dealing with a variety of health issues. We ask that you would be with Bob as he deals with multiple health problems, that you would be with Cheryl's friend dealing with pulmonary fibrosis and waiting for a lung transplant. We lift up David, asking that you would lay your healing hand upon him as he's in the ICU on a ventilator. And we ask that you would be with Helen as she cares for him. We find so many challenges in the world, O oh God, the ongoing pandemic, and we give you thanks that the infection rate seems to be coming down. We give you thanks for all of those who have been working to bring an end to the disease, for those who are working as scientists and as healers. We give you thanks for your presence as we share your love, as we wrap Zyambo in our love and as we ask your grace for him as he grieves the death of his grandmother. We celebrate with the teachers who have given birth this week with Mrs. Christo and Ms. Kaluluka with their babies. We ask your blessing for Adeline and Maya as they experience the beauty of your world and as they grow to become the women that you have called them to be. We give you thanks for Rebecca's presence in the classroom, filling in and teaching in the children. All of these things, O oh God, we lift up, knowing that you are active in the world, that you are bringing about peace and reconciliation, that you are building love. And so we give you thanks for all of these things that you are doing in our midst. We pour out also our personal prayers, those that are too private to speak aloud even knowing that you hear our most intimate prayers, even in the quiet of this moment. Bless us, O Holy One, for we offer our prayers as your loving children. And in the name of Jesus, our brother, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I give thanks for you, for the ways that you live out love, for the ways that you work to expand God's work in the world, for the ways that you use your hands to do God's work, for the ways that you are faithful stewards of all that God has given you. May you, may we, be blessed as we live as stewards of God's realm. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is The Gift of Love.
Though I may speak with bravest fire and have the gift to all inspire and have not love, my words are vain as sounding bright. Gain. Though I may give all I possess, and striving so, my love profess, but not begin by love within the prophet who turn strangely thin come spirit come our hearts control our spirits long to be made whole let inward love guide every by this we worship and are free. Dear friends, let us go forth into the world as children of love. Let us go forth knowing that we walk in God's love and are called to share it. And as we go, let us go forth in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in that holy love that God provides, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who draws us together as one people, now and always. Amen. Amen.